3 p.m. local time for me. So I think we'll start the session now. So um, <clears throat> welcome to everyone. Um, I'm uh, Alastair McDonald and I'll be moderator of uh, today's session. Uh, this is the DCMI Members Forum and it will be the final event in this year's uh, DCMI uh, online conference. Uh, just to remind everyone that the session is being recorded. So um, DCMI is a membership organisation with regional, institutional and individual members. Uh, the purpose of this session is to introduce the conference attendees to the regional and institutional members and allow representatives of those institutions to showcase their metadata work. Uh, this is really an opportunity to see the wide and diverse range of a truly international community of practitioners. Uh, presentations will be covering institutional best practice, standards development, open access repositories, uh, as well as the teaching of information science as an academic subject. And of course, this is very important. Without good teachers, how do we get good practitioners? Uh, the session will run for two hours today with 10 lightning talks. Uh, there will also be uh, time for Q&A at the end. Uh, please put your questions in the chat. Um, some of the um, presenters may also respond to the questions in the chat uh, during the course of the session. Uh, if time allows, we'll have a short break uh, in the middle. And uh, finally, at the end of the uh, session, Sam Arp will um, just come in with some final remarks and to close this year's conference. And our um, first presenter today is Yoon Young Choi. And she is the Deputy Manager, the Bibliographic Control Division at the National Library of Korea. Uh, she has responsibility for maintaining the library's metadata standards and practice. And she holds a bachelor's, master's and PhD in library and information science. So, Yoon Young, uh, I'll hand over to you. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> okay, I will start. Uh, okay. Okay, can you, uh, my presentation is, is okay? okay. Yeah, it's okay, but we see the next slide also. Yes. If that's your intention, but yeah, yeah that, that's better. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 you can start. Okay. Well, uh, in fact, uh, my slides provide. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Yoon Dong Choi, uh, working at the National Library of Korea. Uh, my slides uh, provide an overview of our work, but today I would like to introduce activities for the bibliographic standardization of the NLK to DCMI members very, very briefly, and next to tell you our future plans. Uh, NLK, uh, like other national libraries, has a department, the name is Bibliographic Control Division, that manages bibliographic metadata and standards. 
and our roles and functions are specified in the Korean Library Act. Also, there are sub teams, three teams responsible for data standards and identifiers management to do this work. Yes, our department has been accomplishing three functions. The first is the task of creating metadata, and the second is the service for metadata, and third is to manage various rules, guidelines, standards, and identifiers, including ISBN, ISSN, uh, and ISNI related to, to, related to bibliographic metadata. Uh, this slide shows what efforts the NLK is making for high quality metadata. Uh, we have been developing and maintaining three comma formats, and these formats are designated as Korean industrial standards like uh, ISO. And as opened on the webpage for libraries, librarians and researchers. Uh, also, if necessary, uh, every five years, uh, revisions are uh, re reviewed and progress. So we are uh, reviewing uh, two formats, is a uh, uh, bibliographic and authority format, and we'll complete this work in 2023. Uh, next, we manage various metadata application guidelines. Uh, we create and update the detailed manual for each resource type for data consistency, including analog and digital resources and the guidelines for name and corporate authority data and subject headings. Also, we maintain mapping rules between various metadata. NLK is using two metadata format, that is COMAC and uh, MODS developed by a Library of Congress. So to facilitate data sharing at an international level, a mapping rule between MAC21 and COMAC was defined. Currently, this rule is used for batch loading OCLC World CAT. So from next year, we plan to provide Mark 21 data on our website in real time using this mapping. Uh, we have been promoting metadata application at domestic and, and abroad. The NLK has been a regional member of DCMI since uh, 2006. As a member of DCMI, we translate and revise Dublin Core terms into Korean and provide it on our website. Uh, as you know, uh, DC terms has changed a bit in last year. So we reflect this part in 2021. Mm, for reference, we applied Dublin Core to the institutional repository platform operated by NLK called OAK, that means Open Access Korea. About 40 domestic institutions and libraries are using this system to manage and share their digital resources. Uh, this slide is about metadata service of NLK. Uh, since 2016, we have been provided metadata on Korean monograph to OCLC World Care. Uh, this year, we plan to renew the agreement with OCLC and uh, then continue the batch road project for five years. So you can uh, search Korean monograph in old OCLC World Care. Uh, to share our with domestic libraries, we are operating the National Union catalog called the Kodisnet. That means um, Korean uh, library, that library information system network. Uh, there are currently 18 libraries participating in Kodisnet. 
Also, we maintain various various rules so that our metadata can be searched by users and better. Uh, we are defining which access points are used for search, and then the library search engines use it, uses this to allow users to identify and use resources. We define display rules for such result. Because NLK has been applying to metadata such as Mark and Moose, we have been controlling the display rules so that you just don't feel the difference as much as possible between these metadata. Yeah, so let's talk about our future plans of metadata standardization. First, we would like to make an effort to make our traditional cataloging more intelligent and efficient. As a part of that, we are trying to look for quality data beyond the library and use it for cataloging. In addition, we have been expanding our task can be automated by applying emerging technologies. To achieve this goal, metadata standardization and our role will become more important in the future. Next, we are going to re-examine and improve the library search. So far, we've thought of managing metadata and discovering resources as separate things. So catalogers have been focusing on making quality metadata and con concrete rules. And engineers in the library has been in charge of searching. Uh, in August of this year, our library started thinking about the library search based on metadata and uh, is running task force. So we will reflect uh, on the fact that the catalogers view should be expanded because of focusing too much on data quality and volumes. Therefore, we are going to overhaul our indexing rules or ranking criteria for search and trying to improve search by making good use of the unique features and strong points of the library search. Finally, uh, NLK announced a plan to transform the bibliographic tra uh, framework into a linked data framework in called BFRAME. Uh, in September. Uh, yes, we uh, will transform B-Frame by 2030. We plan to develop various tools and rules for B-Frame transition over the next 10 years. To this end, we will work with the Korean libraries to develop a stable and gradual transition plan. We also plan to develop and strengthen our library staff as a metadata experts. So I wish uh, that we could have achieved the plan I mentioned today, uh, step by step each year, and to share I, our experience with the Dublin Core uh, members. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Yinyang. And um, now we move on to our uh, next presenter, uh, Wei Liu. Wei is the Deputy Director of Shanghai Library. He's also uh, Adjunct Professor of Fudan University, East China Normal University and Shanghai University, where he's a doctoral tutor and uh, lecturer in digital libraries and digital humanities. Wei. Thank you, thank you, Alastair. Uh, hello, friends. I'm very happy to see you in this way. Uh, the title of my talk has changed a little bit. Now it is make metadata a must in libraries and glowing with DCMI. Some people say we have entered an era of VUCA. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. 
The COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 has brought great changes to the whole world and our library profession has also changing, also changing at the, an accelerated pace. More emphasis on remote services and unmanned services, both of which need to improve the content of wisdom in library services. So the application of new technologies has received more attention and investment. And the concept of smart libraries has become a buzzword in China. In the deployment of the whole service platform, a new architecture is needed. We have introduced the concept of data middle platform in the implementation of Folio, including microservices, container orchestration, DevOps, and other concepts of cloud native technology. They are fully compatible with the middle platform service architecture and a new semantic based content architecture can be deployed accordingly. The content architecture allows the reader to only care about the content and query by, uh, to knowledge directly without having the, to understand the structure of the database or having retrieval skills. A range of tasks, including finding, correlating, analyzing, and visualizing will be made very easy. This is the ultimate goal of ontology-based content architecture that we are still on the way to achieve. As described by Arrow in the opening keynote, they have already done a good job of implementing it. As you may have seen, there is a lot of metadata work behind this. We can say that metadata has become a must for libraries and other similar institutions and will become the major task in the future, which we call this in, uh, is our core competence. Professor Masha Zhen has the term called smart data. We are processing and producing smart data and then making the library more intelligent. The future of libraries lives in knowledge services instead of book or periodical services. The basis of library knowledge service is no longer the processing of the carrier or media, but directly the processing of the content. There is a fatal difficulty in knowledge services. That is, it is very difficult to obtain the demand. People will never ask questions about something they know nothing about. In the era of paper media, what to read and whether it is understandable are matters of readers themselves. The knowledge service must express it, the semantics in advance and organize knowledge directly, which has a great difficulty in presenting the original structure of knowledge and conforming the way of user cognize. This is the biggest difficulty for libraries to develop the applications and with latest technologies at present. The shortcut is to start with the smallest unit of knowledge and semantics and accumulate it gradually. Many a little makes a mickle. Content architecture is closer to the way people perceive, which is what computer technology has been pursuing. The history of DCMI, DCMI development is in line with this process. As Tom Baker reviewed the development, the development of DCMI in the era of Metadata 1.0, we used the clay tablets and the cards to record the descriptive information. In the era of Metadata 2.0, we have had machine readable data to help us record and process descriptive information in a closed system. And we are now in the era of Metadata 3.0, where our descriptive information can describe each other, make associations. For the most of us, 
it is DC metadata made us realize the existence of metadata. The history of DCMI is almost the history of metadata concept. We are now moving towards the metadata 4.0, where data becomes smart data by enrich of metadata, making it self-explanatory and actionable. And the resulting of content architecture allows us to deliver knowledge by manipulating and transmitting semantics. We need to develop DCMI in practice, make DCMI standards and protocols more applicable and practical, and integrate DC's metadata ideas into various endeavors that libraries are undertaking. That is smart library construction, digital humanity platform de deployment, de development, et cetera. Although DC is the first semantic element set on the internet and the first brought the content description in a machine readable way, it stopped at 15 elements and many qualifiers with quite a lot of talented inventions such as application profile, abstract model, and so on. The metadata practi practitioner need help from DCMI to reach a balance between the core element set and domain extensions. They will get more progress if DCMI can go one step further to help domain applications make better use of semantics, provide the content architecture, make data smarter, and help library provide knowledge services. I believe that this is the opportunity for DCMI to gain resilience and sustainability in the future. And we should continue to work on it. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ray. Our uh, next uh, presentation comes from Lynette Ng. Uh, Lynette is in charge of the digital cataloging service at the National Library Board at Singapore. She oversees the team's creation of metadata records for a range of services, including the uh, Web Archives of Singapore and projects to develop discoverability of the National Library Board's digital objects and services. Lynette. Hello, I'm Lynette, a librarian of National Library Board Singapore. I'm under the Resource Discovery Management Division and am currently overseeing the digital cataloging team. I'll be sharing on how Dublin Core is used at the NLB. And this is the agenda for the sharing today. I'll be doing an introduction of NLB and following it up with how Dublin Core is used within the organization. I'll also be touching on our collaboration with libraries and public agencies using Dublin Core standards and principles as a base. I will then end the presentation with our current and future work in linked data in relation to Dublin Core. So who are we? The National Library Board Singapore oversees a network of 25 public libraries, two partner libraries as well as the National Library. The National Library is the custodian of the cultural and literary heritage of Singapore. Since 2012, after the inclusion of National Archives of Singapore as an institution under NLB, NLB's role has expanded beyond the cultural and literary heritage to encompass the political, economic and social heritage of Singapore. Through the years, NLB has continually advanced ourselves through our strategic blueprint. While digital collection and cataloging have been a part of NLB's strategic blueprint since the beginning, it has increasingly gained importance. I'll be sharing on how the digital cataloging team has adopted the metadata standards from DCMI and adapted it for use across our digital collections and beyond. Over the years, NLB has built up a huge collection to meet the diverse needs of its patrons. There are currently millions of digital resources that are available to the public through the different public-facing sites on NLB's webpage and these digital resources are increasing on a yearly basis. So in order to provide better discoverability and access to the general public, 
it is imperative that the cataloging of these objects are standardized. Therefore, NLB created the NLB application profile in 2004 to meet this need. The AP was adapted from DC Library's application profile and is reviewed biannually to ensure that it continues to meet the needs of NLB. The AP aims to provide guidance to staff in applying metadata elements and extensions and is a basis for the crosswalk from different cataloging standards across the different formats to enable common searchability. This is an example of how DC is used within NLB. As the library management system could not support a cataloging template based on Dublin Core, we created our own DC cataloging editor back in 2004. This system, known as the generic template.net or gt.net, is still used today for the cataloging of NLB's digital collections. Values and fields in NLB AP, including principles governing the repeatability of fields, mandatory or, or optional obligations are managed in this editor. GT.NET also makes an API call to our vocabulary management system to populate fields such as creator names and contributor roles with authorized terms. So this is how the metadata created is published by the content management system or NLB microsites to assist users in the discovery of the resources described. There are currently six microsites described using Dublin Core that is accessible by the public. These are Web Archive Singapore, History SG, Book SG, the National Online Repository of the Arts, uh, also known as NORA in short, Music SG and Picture SG. Each of these sites is dedicated to the specialized collections they are named for. With the inclusion of the National Archives in 2012, there was a need to consolidate the collection that now encompasses libraries and archives to provide a unified search experience. With the launch of OneSearch in 2014, NLB integrated metadata from galleries, libraries, archives and museums, known as the GLAM sector, into one. OneSearch became the first platform in Singapore to provide a seamless search experience across GLAM. So the key to discovery across institutions without overwhelming the user is to organize their collections into nine containers or bento boxes. Facets such as collections, subject and language were extracted from the normalized metadata to provide alternative access points. NLB has since collaborated with more libraries and institutions to make their resources searchable via OneSearch. So in order to enable cross-collection searching, harmonization or mapping of the metadata is required due to the different standards used by the different institutions. As a library, NLB uses Mark 21 for its physical collection, while the National Archive of Singapore uses the International Standard Archival Description, or ISADG. And Singapore's museums use a light version of the categories for description of works of art, or CDWA. There is also the issue of granularity. Libraries organize and group collections by items, whereas the archives relate objects by hierarchy at the collection level. Museums describe the materials used, techniques, styles and period are not commonly found in the descriptions of libraries and archives. Therefore, cataloging standards were first reviewed within the respective collection and mapped to the corresponding fields found in NLB's AP. However, due to the constraints highlighted, additional steps are required during this mapping process. So an example of this is the object type for the museum collection. Artifacts from the museums do not fall neatly within the categorization of the library and archives. Hence, a list of terms that are used to describe museum objects were mapped into controlled terms in the NLB AP. These are then put as a search facet that users can explore, which will subsequently lead them to the content under the owning website. Mapping and consolidation of control vocabularies across the three collections were performed before ingestion into NLB's repository. 
With the experience gained and requests received from other institutions, NLB began to collaborate with more agencies. One such institution is the National University of Singapore Libraries Digital Gems. The Digital Gems is the primary source of collection of NUS libraries for rare and historical digital objects. Since the start of the project, a total of 19,000 records have been mapped to DC. Some data conversion and standardization of content types were done to align the terminologies before the items were ingested. Since then, a 50% increase in usage was observed after the resource was made discoverable on NLB's OneSearch. Other than collaborating with library institutions, NLB has also leveraged on our expertise in digital cataloging to create a metadata framework to enable the discovery of objects that are not library, archives, or museums related. In 2017, NLB was invited to develop an application profile and a faceted taxonomy for a whole of government app known as the Life SG app. This app consolidates government services such as subsidies and benefits for important milestones in a citizen's life. An important factor to be considered when developing the application profile was that the creators of metadata are non-catalogers and the consumers of the app are everyday citizens. Hence, rounds of discussion took place between NLB and the government agencies involved, during which eight common DC terms and an extension of six data elements from schema.org was incorporated into the Live SGAP. To enable ease of discovery and navigation, a faceted taxonomy was created comprising namely of three facets, the type, topic, and target audience. The terms were used by agencies to tag the resources. Since 2014, the cataloging team has also worked to deliver linked data for NLB with the aim of enhancing the discovery of NLB's resources through RDF technology. We adopted a light version of Big Frame version 1 anthology and converted about 3.2 million records comprising our authority files, Dublin Core Metadata, Mark 21 Metadata, and entities extracted using named entity recognition. This form NLB's knowledge graph comprising about 188 million triples. Our data sets are published as linked open data since July 2016, which allows us to share data with external parties. With linked open data, we were able to deliver a knowledge panel on one search which consists of bite-sized information about personalities, places and organisations known as entity data. A linked data widget was also launched on two of our microsites which feature Singapore content. This widget provides users links to more information about the entities within NLB's resources. Since 2019, NLB have also implemented a schema.org structured data on NLB sites and collection, which allows search engines to understand the content on NLB sites and highlight them to users. NLB is currently working on establishing a new linked data management system to deliver a linked data catalog with a discovery interface centered on knowledge card, semantic search and links to Wikidata as a key feature. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Lynette. And uh, next we have uh, Freddie Sumba from the Ecuadorian National Research and Education Network. And Freddie will be looking at the Ready Plus initiative to uh, develop a central aggregator for open access repositories in uh, Ecuador. Freddie. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Right. Okay. Um, the project the name is the Tower Ecuadorian Research Information Platform based in Greece. The intention of this project is to have a national research observatory 
let me let me show some data about how is the science of open data in Latin America. Uh, I have the data about a survey that is the name of data index. Uh, this survey shows some indicators. For example, the, these indicators have three sub indicators that is uh, data disponibility, uh, data, data uh, availability, and the how to the government uh, help to reuse the data in Latin American countries. Uh, you can see that Ecuador is in the last position the score the Ecuador in about open data government is 0 that 29 and for this reason we have different projects and CIDIA to help to the community of research to use more tools to improve the open science in Ecuador right and CEDIA have been working in different projects uh, since 2010. Uh, we have implemented the national your, uh, your, your slides haven't come up on screen. You can see my, my screen? Uh, it's just saying started screen sharing. Uh, we, me... we do not see the slides. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, there we go. Okay, there we are. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. And uh, so they have been working in different projects, uh, like the national aggregator. Uh, there is a node of the project of the reference in Latin America, and in twenty nineteen we have. We have a, we have been established collaboration with the government to improve the institutions to use different uh, open science technologies and, and solutions that we have in different countries or in different projects. And in the last year, we have been working and uh, started start working in, in a project called the National Research Observatory, uh, based in Greece. The intention of this project is to improve the, or, or let a solution for manage the bibliographic results, research data sets, research profiles, patents, uh, technology resources, Congress, and give at the government and, and the institutions national metrics and indicators. The project have the intention to manage the research ecosystem in Ecuador to provide uh, different actors and institutions uh, a lot of solutions that we can construe. In this project, we have different technologies that, uh, for example, we, we have used uh, some techniques of machine learning to, to, to solve the, the ambiguation of the authors um, or researchers. We have different hardware to collect data uh, or from different repositories. We, we have uh, the intention to use this wrap uh, project for, for have a different profile applications. And the last project that CoAR have a basic notification, linking data notification to, to send a different notification to the institutions, to the pro, uh, researchers about different uh, data that they have or publish in the country. Right, and the intention or the aim of this observatory is to have a centralized, centralized search of resources. You have a unique point where you can, you can search a, a doctoral thesis, master thesis, a patents, a congress or events in Ecuador. Uh, research publications uh, uh, and other that you have. Uh, you can see data sets. We have been using a database for this and have different institutional system created in each institutions or universities in Ecuador. And to this data, it helped us to identify research trends that we have in, in, the, in the country. 
right? And the intention uh, in the top level is to have uh, national metrics and indicators to take decision on different levels. Right, and this is a some solution that is part of the zip project. For example, we have a Vivo platform to have a quiz system in the institutions. We have been working with Dataverse. We are members of the global consortium of Dataverse. It also, different institutions have this space quiz. We use a lot of open source that allows to use different uh, platforms or techniques based in leaking data, web semantic, and, and machine learning to improve this observatory. Uh, there is some uh, slides of the platform. We have the profile of research that have information about uh, indicators of publications, citation, and the knowledge area that the research works, and what is the co authors or partners in research. And in the right, we have the graph that shows what is the network or collaboration of these different researchers in specific areas of knowledge. This information is built using a machine learning and data mining techniques and linking data to establish the, the linking between different areas or, or subjects that the authors have. Uh, the demo is in this URL, and this is a, a print screen about uh, trends in research in Ecuador, uh, taking data about different repositories, and have meaning this data to to show what is the trend in research areas uh, in the last years. And it is, it is interesting uh, to, to give some visual interactive uh, in, in between institutions or universities. Uh, these lines represent uh, how many projects or publication they are have in collaboration. Uh, between project and research projects or papers that they publish. And at the finish, we have different universities in the country that there is shows how, how many publications they publish in, in, in a specific year. For example, we have the bigger universities that have most publications. And we identify in which areas of knowledge this publication are uh, work, for example, in computer science is, is the, the topic and the top uh, medicine, engineering, uh, and different areas that algorithms identify. And for this project, we have different infrastructure in the cloud and the on-premise and the public cloud that help to us uh, develop different techniques, algorithms to develop this project. The intention is that the next year they publish this project that, and the universities will, will start to use this platform. Uh, this is all, thank you. Thank you very much, Freddie. Um, okay, so I think we should be pausing the recording now, Sonny, if we... And um, our next presenter is uh, Elena Patricio. Elena is a uh, director of the Special Collection Services at the National Library of Portugal, and she's held that um, position since 2012. Uh, she's in charge of the National Digital Library and managing uh, several national and European digitization projects. Um, she graduated initially in law before her postgraduate degree in library and information science. And the National Library of Portugal is also the most recent institution to join DCMI, uh, actually joining this year. So, Helena. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, we are really happy to be part of the Dublin Core community uh, and uh, for the invitation to share uh, our work with you. Um, let me share the screen. Uh, 
So um, I will describe uh, briefly uh, the main aspects uh, of the National Library of Portugal digital strategy, uh, focusing uh, on our digital collections, uh, on our access services, uh, and on our uh, open data and content reuse policies. Um, just to, to, to give the framework uh, of the strategic goals in which these issues uh, are uh, presented, uh, I would like to uh, highlight that um, uh, in what concerns our digital collection, uh, we, uh, one of our uh, main goals in the last uh, 20 years uh, was to foster the digital collection growth uh, and to obtain and to achieve this goal, uh, to uh, reinforce our digitiza digitization uh, capabilities. Um, and to do so, we have reviewed our uh, information model and uh, all uh, our production uh, tools and uh, storage infrastructure. Uh, and I will describe this briefly. I will also talk about uh, our new services and functionalities in the last years and uh, about uh, our uh, open data and open content uh, policies. So in what concerns our digital collection, it is uh, a small collection. Uh, we have uh, around uh, 40,000 uh, uh, objects uh, that uh, corresponds to uh, 4 million uh, images um, and we are expecting to have a big uh, increase in these uh, numbers in the following five years uh, because of uh, European Union uh, funding that will uh, be given to, to our country and that will be invested, invested mainly in uh, digital transformation um, activities. So we expect to have uh, 22 million uh, images in the more in the next years. And to, to achieve this, and just to briefly describe our digital collection uh, is mainly um, uh, uh, books uh, in what uh, concerns uh, the number of images. Uh, and um, our documents that are digitized, uh, they, the, the oldest document uh, in the library is from uh, 2010 uh, and it is digitized and available. Uh, so our digital objects uh, span from uh, uh, 12th century uh, documents until uh, our uh, recent ebooks. Um, the selection criteria of uh, to digitize material uh, were during the years uh, to, they focused on uh, rare and unique materials, uh, special collections, um, and uh, fragile and uh, difficult to handle documents. Uh, so uh, I think it is common with most of, uh, of uh, the organizations. Uh, that digitize their, their documents. Um, to achieve uh, the goal of uh, increasing our digital collection, we, we revised uh, all the information model in uh, uh, 2015, um, both in the data model component and in the metadata profile component. Uh, and why was this necessary? Because uh, we needed to simplify the data model. Uh, the initial uh, digital library data model had uh, lots of um, duplicated uh, elements uh, and values and information. So we needed to simplify the model in order to achieve uh, more efficiency in the production of the digital objects. We also needed to replace some uh, local schema we had because uh, the digital library started in 2000. And by that time, uh, there were not uh, some uh, standards that are available to today or were not developed and available uh, back then. 
So he had some uh, local schema that were replaced by uh, standards since uh, 12, uh, 2015. Uh, and we had to uh, uh, implement new metadata schema that uh, were approved in the meanwhile, uh, like uh, mix, uh, premise, and the auto schema. So uh, we needed to uh, formalize uh, this new data model. Uh, so we could be, and we are right now, aligned with the reference, um, international uh, reference models like uh, OAIS model and digital pre preservation standards like uh, METS and PREMIS and MIX. Uh, and uh, to document all these changes so they could be implemented uh, with our new tool for digital objects uh, production. So we revised uh, all the, the, the data model and implemented it uh, with a new tool in, uh, back in uh, 2015. Uh, this is the, the summary of our um, uh, data model. We have these uh, archival information packages. We have two groups, the, the, the the masters for um, digital preservation and the master for um, uh, public access uh, uh, copies. We also have these information uh, dissemination packages um, and uh, uh, the um, content information and uh, representation information and all the components of uh, OIS um, uh, system. Uh, so we implemented a new uh, tool to, 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 pro uh, to produce our digital objects and to manage the workflow. Um, and uh, this tool allowed us uh, to have new functionalities like uh, PDF, uh, bookmarks uh, automatically created, uh, public domain dates, um, uh, embedded OCR and things like that that are trivial now but were uh, pretty new uh, in uh, uh, six years ago. Uh, so this is the, the how this our tool uh, looks like. Um, we are right now implementing a new tool. Um, that will uh, allow us to gain more efficiency and uh, uh, to have uh, IIIF um, manifestations and other uh, functionalities that are really important, uh, both to our integration with Europeana and both to um, and also to uh, to to gain more uh, speed and. Uh, um, quality in the publication process because of the uh, new workload that will come in the next years. So we are just in the middle of uh, the implementation of this new of this new tool. But we are maintaining the, the information and metadata model. Uh, another aspect that was really important was the renewal of, of our digital archive. It, it's, it started in 2009 uh, with a three-layer uh, digital archive, and it was upgraded in uh, 2018 and 19 with, with the elastic called uh, storage. Um, this is the functionalities of, uh, of our tool that are not new anymore, so I will pass this. <laughs> we had this big problem because we had this flash uh, format and it was discontinued. It will be replaced until the next, until the end of the year. So uh, we are, uh, we have uh, a very good um, access uh, uh, numbers and visits. Uh, we count 8 million visits per year. One visit is 20 minutes in the digital object. Uh, Portugal has uh, 10 million habitants. 
So this is really good, good numbers for us. Of course, we, we have uh, lots of uh, Brazilian and uh, Portuguese speaking countries uh, in these visits, but it's uh, really, uh, really uh, good numbers. They came from Google and also from our catalog. This is not new also. Uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, these new services we had uh, in the last um, uh, 20 years. In 2011, we, we created the uh, RONOD, National Registry for Digital Objects, which is the Portuguese aggregator to Europeana for bibliographic material. Uh, this is maintained uh, and, um, and uh, managed by the National Library of Portugal. Uh, and it aggregates um, data, uh, metadata from, for, from more than uh, 40 partners and deliver it to uh, Europeana. Uh, this was a new service uh, that was created in uh, 2017. Uh, which is the National Registry for Objects in Accessible uh, Formats for the Blind. Well, I will go. We are integrated in Europeana, in Patrimonio Digital Iberia Americano, and Biblioteca Digital Luso Brasileira, uh, which is our um, partners from Brazil and for um, uh, Latin America. Uh, and uh, we are pursuing uh, a policy of open data and open content. Uh, this was always our policy, but it's gaining, it's making, we are making it more explicit and tagging with, uh, with um, uh, Creative Commons licenses uh, to comply with uh, the Public Sector Information Directive uh, and, uh, uh, and other uh, requirements. We have this uh, portal, the Open Data Portal, in which we uh, uh, aggregate all the services uh, that uh, users can use uh, to, to retrieve and reuse our data. Uh, these are the schemas and the formats that uh, are available. Um, and we are starting right now our policy in, we have this uh, Wikidata and Wikicommons pilot uh, with the Wikimedia Foundation Portugal. Uh, and we are starting our uh, linked data um, strategy. Uh, we have, uh, we began with uh, persistent identifiers, but so far our, um, uh, our activities in linked data uh, were are connected with the uh, uh, VIAF and the uh, European Data Model um, uh, uh, pilot uh, projects. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. I, I do have to say I really uh, greatly enjoyed my visit to the National Library of Portugal uh, several years ago, and it's great to see so many uh, wonderful things going on there. Um, our next presenter is uh, Yuha Hakala. Uh, Yuha is a uh, senior advisor at the National Library of Finland, where he's responsible for standards related work. Uh, his involvement with Dublin Core began with the second Dublin Core workshop held in Warwick, April 1996, and he was a member of the Board of Trustees from 2002 to 2011. So, Yuha. Thank you, Alistair. Um, um, <clears throat> I have a short presentation describing the work on um, scholarly resources application profile. And uh, first, I want to remind you that uh, what I'm showing here is, is work in progress. So there is relatively little here that is actually finite and, and decided. The problem uh, this application profile is trying to solve is that um, in its present form, the Dublin Core is not really a great tool for describing scholarly resources. 
and uh, quite a lot of uh, various problems um, can stem from that. This list of three issues here in the slide is um, not a, a full list, but they are the ones that I think are the most serious ones. Um, people have extended Dublin Core in various ways, uh, which in itself is duplicate effort. And then uh, the tools we have in repositories, they do not support these extensions. And um, perhaps most irritatingly, even if we have the uh, same data elements in our extensions, we express them in different ways so that the semantic interoperability is reduced or lost completely. So what we are doing is, is a, a, a tool that will enable us to describe uh, various kind of scholarly resources, scholarly works, uh, meaning, uh, for instance, scientific articles, uh, master's thesis, uh, doctoral dissertations, and so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, once this application profile is completed, we want to extend the DCMI metadata terms with these uh, new terms. Uh, important caveat is that we are not uh, uh, creating a tool that would be appropriate for description of research data sets. Uh, that is, is a very complex domain in itself and I think that it requires an application profile of its own. Uh, the original proposal that we made uh, contained a domain model, and uh, I suppose this one will will remain fairly stable, even if the terms or elements themselves are changing. So there are agents that uh, create uh, scholarly resources. These agents are, uh, they have an affiliation, certain kind of organization, and the scholar resources themselves may be related to data sets that they are referring to. Then the elements that uh, we are proposing, there are two kinds of them, uh, generic ones and the ones that we believe are specific to scholarly resources. And the list of, of generic elements is uh, represented here. Um, the basis for these elements uh, is uh, um, the extension of Dublin Core that we have created in Finland for institutional repositories, plus the extensions that the British Library has created for ethos service and a, a scholarly works draft profile that was developed in the UK a long time ago. So in a sense, all these proposed elements are battle proven. Somebody is using them somewhere and probably quite a few institutional repositories have these or similar extensions. Time doesn't allow any detailed handling of, of these. Then these are the ones, uh, the elements that are <clears throat> specific to scholarly resources. And as you can tell, these are indeed fairly specific, like an opponent of uh, uh, someone who is defending a dissertation or grant number. Uh, publication status uh, is, uh, is uh, scholarly resources limited because we look at this strictly from a scholarly resources point of view. And we want to use the core uh, version types vocabulary. However, uh, Core 
vocabulary only contains uh, uh, statuses that cover the living document from preprint to the actual publication. And we want to add uh, also things that are relevant after the document itself is gone, but the Dublin Core record describing it is still there as a tombstone. And we are discussing with the core people about adding these to the uh, vocabulary itself. And then we are refining uh, some of the uh, Dublin core elements so that they are more appropriate for the kind of um, work that we are doing. So for instance, access rights, um, Again, we want to use a core vocabulary, but the one for access rights in this case. And, and for resource types, uh, the core resource types vocabulary covers various um, scholarly resources pretty well. And we want to strongly recommend usage of it in, in a SRAP uh, context uh, since, uh, coordinating the input of various kind of uh, resource types will make the data much more interoperable than it would be if there would be no control in input. Um, we have a process in place for, for creating uh, this um, profile. So we have a working group in place, which has been nominated uh, formally to draft a revised version of the SRAP profile, revised from the original proposal that was drafted by the National Library of Finland. And everything that we do is available in GitHub in that uh, address that you see below. And uh, once uh, the working group is, is uh, happy with the result, uh, we will pass uh, the result to the usage board, which will revive, review both the application profile and the proposed terms. And while we are working on the application profile, DCMI itself is specifying rules for the application profile development process. Um, we are hoping that this will encourage other parties uh, to create new application profiles in the future. And this would lead into a semantic extension of the DCMI metadata terms, which would be, I think, useful both for DCMI and for Dublin Core users. Um, summary. Um, I think it is important that after a, a 15 year period during which the Dublin core metadata terms <clears throat> have not been extended. There is now a way of, of uh, kind of expanding the DCMI scope in a, in a controlled manner. And this uh, <clears throat> requires a clear cut process that people who want to develop new application profiles will see how this uh, can be done and the scholarly resources application profile is the first one that will be built uh, following this new model that uh, hopefully will be finished soon. Thank you. Thank you, Yuha. I think this is a really great example of um, how um, different members of the DCMI community work together. And it's been a great pleasure uh, to be part of the working group uh, with you. It's uh, been a great pleasure for me to work with you in that working group. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's, that's very kind of you. Um, uh, the next presenter is me. Um,
I'm Alastair MacDonald and I am Metadata Coordinator at the University of Edinburgh Library. Um, I manage uh, an integrated um, metadata team. Uh, we cover uh, metadata for all our new purchases, both print and electronic for our main bibliographic catalogue. Uh, my team also uh, does a lot of work with our special collections and heritage collections, um, mostly in the areas of rare books, but we are looking to expand that. And um, we're also responsible for um, metadata for our um, doctoral thesis collections as well. And um, that's what I'm going to be looking at today. So, founded um, in 1583, the uh, University of Edinburgh is a large research intensive uh, university. Um, and uh, we do have uh, library collections uh, to, to go along with that. Uh, the building you can see here is our main uh, library building. Uh, and uh, we've also been um, DCMI institutional members since 2017. Uh, this building is our medical school, which opened in 1888. And this is the reason uh, why we have uh, very long uh, standing collections of uh, doctoral theses. Uh, we, uh, the earliest we have are for the award of Doctor of Medicine in uh, 1726. The thesis collection really goes into three defined time periods. We have the earliest, which were actually published pamphlets. Uh, these are uh, actually fully catalogued to rare book standards. We then have what we call our early collection, um, middle of the 19th century, around 1200, and these are handwritten manuscripts. Uh, we then have what we call our modern thesis collection from the 1880s onwards, and that's when we return to typeset. And um, more recently, of course, we have um, had electronic deposits. Uh, our physical copies are catalogued on our ALMA library management system and our digital copies are held in the Edinburgh Research Archive. That's our institutional repository and that is uh, an instance of DSpace. And of course, 1880s onwards, we don't just have Doctor of Medicine, we start to see other areas of academia coming into the collection. Um, we have done quite a bit of work uh, with the digitization project. Uh, this happened 2016 to 2018. We did digitize everything back to the earliest uh, pamphlets, but for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus more on the modern collection um, because that's where we've done the most work. Uh, so a few key dates. Um, from 2005, we requested that new starting um, doctoral students would submit uh, one physical and one electronic copy. So from 2008 onwards, we, we began to see this coming in. We have around 8,000 electronic theses deposited and catalogued in our institutional repository currently. Uh, and in 2020, uh, we decided that the deposit of a physical copy was no longer required. Um, so our project 2016 to 2018 had the objective of digitizing everything back to our earliest theses, uh, but also we would create, ensure that there was uh, at least basic metadata for all physical and digital copies. Uh, this is just a simplified workflow diagram. So for the modern collection, we extracted our metadata uh, for those that have been catalogued, the, uh, the print versions, most of them had. Um, and from that, that provided uh, an inventory document. Uh, the digitization team checked that everything was where it should be on the shelves. For the uncatalogued titles, they collected what we had as a sort of key uh, series of elements that we wanted. Uh, we wanted the title, the full uh, author name as we found it, uh, on the title page, or indeed the submission document, if that was there, the award type, the date of submission, and the date at which the, um, uh, the doctorate was awarded. 
Um, we found that we had around 17,000 uh, which had been catalogued and these were all digitized. Uh, and of these, uh, sorry, there was about 17,000 were digitized in all. Uh, around 5,600 were uncatalogued uh, on Alma. And um, we can see um, what we did was we, uh, we used the metadata that we'd taken from Alma that was then repurposed, uh, converted into our locally qualified um, in a version of, of Dublin Core. Obviously, um, Yuha's presentation has a lot of resonance for us. And the data that had been captured by the digitization team was then loaded into Alma for the uncatalogued theses as well. Uh, the last slide, you can see that one of um, the places where we send our metadata uh, for our um, Theses is to uh, Ethos, the British Library's Union Catalogue for um, Theses in the UK. Uh, just a few headline figures from that, really. Um, we were the first UK uh, university to digitise all our historical thesis collections. I don't know if we, if we still are, uh, but what we can see is that um, we have the highest count of theses which are accompanied by an institutional repository URL. And um, that's in, uh, an indication that there is a digital um, version available. Uh, you can also see that we have a little over 11,000 ISNI identifiers, which the British Library have assigned uh, to the authors of our thesis collections. Um, I have contacted the British Library and they've said that this is mostly for the, uh, for the recent submissions from the past decade or so. Uh, but really looking at how at identifying the authors and finding um, permanent identifiers for them uh, is going to be the next bit of my talk. Because we managed to integrate creating at least basic metadata with the um, inventory and digitization workflows, we decided to use our uh, metadata budget for um, metadata enhancement. Um, initially looking to try and identify who the authors of our historical theses were. Um, and we found a pilot study 30 to 40% of 20th century PhD authors could be identified in the Library of Congress name authority file. Uh, we use that for our main bibliographic catalogue. Um, obviously that doesn't cover cases such as um, scientists who may have published widely in academic journals, but haven't written uh, a full a monograph. So we decided to adopt a wide range of identity man uh, management initiatives, ISNI, BIAF, ORCID, and most recently Wikidata. We also chose to adopt our ALMA catalog as our source of canonical metadata, uh, really because there's a very simple procedure for recording a permanent identifier for your author in MARC format. We also looked uh, to see if we could find any um, footprint of uh, our authors in Wikipedia. If we did, we would link uh, the pages back to the ERA um, catalog. We would upgrade stub records and we'd also create uh, new pages for those who thought uh, should have one. Uh, this was also uh, as much to increase the impact of the university and our collections uh, in Wikipedia. Uh, this did also tie in with initiatives to increase the number of uh, women working in STEM subjects. So uh, here's an example that we have. This is Anne Silver's Wikipedia page created by um, one, of our, one of my team. Um, she's, a, uh, she's a prominent um, British um, physiologist. Uh, she didn't actually have um, a Wikipedia page until it was created. This links you back to ERA. And uh, also we created a wiki data page for her as well. Uh, this is an example from um, our Alma catalogue for Mona Chalmers Watson. Uh, she was the first woman to receive the award of Doctor of Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Um, went on to a very long, a very interesting life, never published a book. And so we have used her wiki data identity as her permanent identifier and that's recorded here. Uh, but when we look at her record for her thesis in ERA, uh, it says Alexandra Mary Campbell Geddes. Of course uh, that was her name 
uh, when she uh, wrote her thesis. So really, uh, just a quick overview of, of what really the point of doing all this is. Uh, ultimately, we're looking to upload a data set to Wikidata with identifiers uh, for our creators and for the subjects. Um, for example, having uh, the topics for um, thesis for the award of uh, Doctor of Medicine back to 1726 could be a really interesting data set. But we have several issues. Obviously, as we've just seen, ERA and ALMA are not necessarily in alignment because we've done the, uh, the work for the canonical set in ALMA. So we need to look at options for automation and overlay. We could, I think, make better use of subject vocabularies. Um, long, carefully constructed LCSH strings are all well and good, but uh, perhaps we want to look at uh, more use of um, NLM headings or FAST or other subject specific vocabularies. And also with our older theses, these could be very rich in, in authority and graph data, but we have things to deal with such as the need for paleography skills or indeed the Latin text of the uh, theses and the title pages. So uh, I think I'll just leave it there. And uh, thank you. Okay. Um, so now move on to our next presenter, uh, Joseph Tennis. Uh, Joe's a professor, associate dean for faculty affairs an executive director of Administra administrative services at the University of Was Washington Information School. He's also adjunct professor in linguistics and a member of the textual studies, computational linguistics and museology faculty advisory groups. He's held many visiting professorships and is a member of both the DCMI governing and usage boards. Joe. Thank you very much, Alistair. Let me share my screen. Hello, everyone. Hope you are all well. Um, the title of my talk is Problem Solved, Metadata Explorations versus Metadata Education. Um, I will take sort of a, uh, a high level view or a synthetic view on uh, what I think is valuable um, in metadata education um, as it relates to um, the practice of metadata work. Uh, as my introduction already stated, I have these affiliations. Um, the only thing I would add is I've been active in the Interquires Research Project since 2005, which is a multi-continent, uh, multinational uh, records preservation uh, research project, which has provided me a huge amount of insight into metadata um, working in that, in that community. So I guess I'll just start by saying um, many who come to metadata think of it primarily as a problem solving activity. They have this pile of stuff, digital or otherwise, that they want to organize and label, and they think it's a very common sense exercise. Um, and in, in some degree, they're not wrong. Um, that is, there's a very practical aspect to what we do when we do metadata work. However, uh, I would argue solving the immediate organizational and representational concerns that we may have in front of us may introduce new problems for designers and engineers of such systems down the line. Um, and I think metadata education is about moving this common sense idea of design and implementation out of the problem solving zone and into the realm of expertise. Um, into a very deep and wide literature that we have uh, that has been written by practitioners as well as uh, theorists. So I think um, one of the things that we can, or a couple of the things we can tease out um, and sort of abstract from metadata education um, are these considerations, time, domains, context, interoperability, and ethics. And so in this very brief talk that I'm going to give, I uh, will cover um, what I think um, uh, how I think about curriculum related to metadata and how it moves it from problem solving um, to perhaps it's not so clever to problem solve. That is, we already understand some of these things because of our uh, literature and the education. So what do I mean by time, domains, context, interoperability, and ethics? Well, so with time, how does metadata age? Um, uh, domains, who uses metadata? the context, what is the metadata used for, what's its purpose. Um, with interoperability, of course, how do we port metadata from one context to another, and we've heard uh, in this session uh, concerns around that. Um, and then ethics, um, what is the axiological effect of metadata, that is, how does it help or harm uh, people, groups, um, 
beliefs, values. Um, and so the first uh, concern time is very close to my heart. It's part of my research agenda. Um, what we see in front of us here is the um, range of DDC, Dewey Decimal Classification numbers from zero to 999, from 1870 to 2000, specifically around anatomy from 1870 to 2010. Um, and uh, the classes that are possible in DDC are the squares um, and the diamonds are where catalogers have put books with the first subject heading as anatomy in the classification scheme. So you can see there's quite a lot of synergy here around the 600s, um, but there are some uh, places where uh, catalogers have decided that uh, uh, books about anatomy should be in a different discipline um, than the medical sciences, which is 600. Um, but primarily what we were concerned about, concerned about here with metadata education is how do semantics change over time? What does it mean to say something is about anatomy in 1870 versus 2010? How do our practices change around the actual assignment of metadata um, in these systems? What are the rule books that are local? What are the rule books that are international? Um, and what do we do with legacy data? Um, uh, in another example I have, we can clearly see, well, in, in this particular example, you can clearly see there are discontinued classes in Dewey. Um, and we don't really have um, too much problem except um, here where things are discontinued, but uh, people are still putting the, the book in the same spot uh, because of what's actually on in the catalog and on the shelf in, the, in that particular library. Um, so that's legacy data. The schedule has moved on, the classification scheme has moved on, but our collection stays in a different time. Domains is another concern. Who uses metadata? Uh, metadata is built for users and for use. So how do we understand those users and how do we adapt our metadata implementations to reflect their needs? Uh, this is another thing that a data education um, provides us. Simply problem solving um, for yourself in the context of metadata is one thing in a personal information management um, um, context, but um, that's very rarely what we're doing um, when we're doing professional metadata work. What is metadata used for? Uh, for retrieval? Is it used for browsing and sense making? Is it used for attesting the authenticity of records, as is the case of um, archives and records management? Um, is it to tell the history of an artifact, that is, its provenance, um, as is the case uh, in museum metadata? So understanding the actual purpose and context of use um, is important. And the, the visual here is the Interpares application profile that I developed um, in that context of that research group to deal with the chain of preservation uh, metadata concerns that we had for digital records. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that if people are interested. Um, and of course, interoperability, which is the uh, a watchword for Dublin Core. Um, how, how do we make these things reusable? How do we exchange metadata statements um, and vocabularies? Um, but uh, in the context of metadata education, we're really concerned with a whole range of issues related to interoperability, not just semantic, not just technical, but perhaps political, um, socio-political um, barriers um, to metadata. Of course, Dublin Core is, is very concerned with the linguistic um, uh, exchange as well and translation. Um, and so, you know, the other thing to consider is in the context of looking at interoperability, we don't look at it alone, but we look at it in the context of time, domain, and context um, as well, those things that I've mentioned uh, before. Uh, and then finally, um, something that uh, is of deep concern uh, to the research community at the moment and is, uh, may, is a huge part of our curricula um, at the University of Washington Information School is the ethics of metadata. So what are the, how does metadata help or harm particular individuals? Um, and here the example from the 1913 Dewey Decimal Classification um, provides us with a class called Gypsies, Nomads, and Outcast Races. Um, and this is very specifically because um, both people and language at this time in Dewey were were hung off of territorial assignments um, for people and languages. And of course, the Romani uh, people uh, um, were, are, are, are throughout the European continent, um, and so are not fixed to a single land. And so in 1913, because of that organizing principle, um, we're doing a particular kind of labeling to a particular kind of people. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, even in contemporary environment, um, in the context of North America, we deal with First Nations, Native American, um, Indigenous, Metis, and uh, Inuit people. 
uh, how are we working with our information systems to make sure we're not causing harm by the labeling of, of groups and their relation and establishing relationships between those groups and other groups. Um, this is not a, an old thing. Um, we've been talking about this for a while, um, and here are some uh, resources that uh, I think are, are interesting. Um, uh, the, especially the Mary Daly uh, Wickedary uh, work where she, uh, as a radical um, uh, feminist theologian, tried to reshape language um, and the relationships between words and semantics and each other. Um, to recast an anti-patriarchal view. But the more contemporary work by Melissa Adler is very rewarding um, with her cruising the library there. So um, each of these concerns is a long-term concern uh, and they're essential considerations in doing uh, the metadata work that we're doing in my mind. Um, just to contextualize um, the University of Washington, um, we have three campuses, 16 schools. We were founded in 1861 and we have more than 59,000 students. Um, the Information School at the University of Washington has more than 1,700 students as of this fall, 75 academic personnel, which is faculty, researchers, and postdocs. Our librarianship program started in 1911, and we became an iSchool in 1999. And uh, as far as courses, um, this is just a subset of our courses in, in information organization and metadata. Um, this is uh, uh, only within the Library and Information Science program, and we have four other programs. So I think meta education, metadata education moves problem solving mentality into a more sustainable field um, of metadata work. And I wanted to share those perspectives with you today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, so uh, we do now um, have uh, quite a, a good amount of time for uh, Q and A. Um, if, uh, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd actually like to begin by, by asking Joe a question. Um, when you were looking at um, the, sort of the history of application of Dewey, what were the um, challenges to actually finding out how widely um, a particular classification number had been applied historically? Uh, obviously with modern electronic catalogs, we often update things and um, we, don't leave, uh, we don't leave a trail. Yeah, that's the, the, definitely a problem. Um, there was, you know, it's it's sort of a, a little bit of a messy data set. There's a little bit of hand waving that has to be done. Um, we did harvest all the data through the Z39.5, uh, is it 50 or 19? I can't remember which one it is, protocol <laughs> um, through the electronic catalogs. And yes, we were worried about the update. Um, and so um, we were able to infer date of record creation from the MARC field um, and clean that up. Of course, there's been a revision of how that was actually encoded in MARC. It went from a two digit to a four digit uh, mm -hmm. number over time. Um, and then we did some root, um, some spot checking to make sure we understood um, uh, sort of what the quality of the data was that we were looking at and felt relatively confident that we can make some assertions about what we were seeing. Um, and then going to individual libraries because we could see where the, the records came from, even though they were an aggregate and see whether or not we could infer anything from those um, cataloging practices on um, the user interface. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I've got a lot of interesting, uh, 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 there are a lot of interesting problems with the data, that's for sure. I would like to have it all be done the same way, but, um, but um, it was, and I'm sure I'm missing a ton of stuff, right? Because of the revision, right? There, there are revisionist practices, but even within the context of my own library, um, we still retain Dewey records, um, even though we've moved to Library of Congress. Um, and you can see, um, which was a really kind of fun, a fun exercise, the exercise of what I call semantic gravity, where even though the, the edition moved on from and deprecated a class, for example, um, that because we were helping users find things co-located on shelves, we would use the outdated number um, uh, for the same subject um, uh, for considerable years after Dewey had moved on. And I thought that was a really interesting, of course, it's a, it's a common sense uh, practice for practitioners, common sense understanding for practitioners, but um, it makes you wonder sort of how the purpose of this is to co-locate kinds of resources. Um, and if it, things change over, how do we engineer systems so that we help users over time when the scheme changes and practices change? Thanks. And I, I just wonder also as well, if there is any um, application for OCR for um, yeah, and, uh, old card catalogs as well, but yeah, a really big undertaking uh, to actually uh, to do that as well. 
Yeah, one outstanding research question is the is really for trying to provide a context of the semantics of the labels in Dewey in um, the corpus uh, that they were drawing from, if they were drawing from literary warrant. Um, we can do this with Hattie Trust, um, the Google Books research arm, the Hattie Trust, um, and I have yet to do that. I have yet to sort of figure out the quote unquote ground truth of the semantics um, and compare that to the scheme, but that's an outstanding research question that I think would be very interesting. Uh, and uh, do we have any other uh, questions from uh, anyone, uh, either participants or attendees? Sorry, um, Kevin's, um, I do apologize, Arlen, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Arlen is ready to present. Oh dear, uh, Arlen, I'm terribly sorry. Um, it's okay. Uh, so our final um, presentation for the day uh, and also for the conference is uh, Arlen Wetter. Arlen is a librarian who leads the Digital Legal Deposit Unit at the Library and Archives Canada um, for the past five years. Uh, she's been working with a project team to develop and implement uh, new transport workflows for digital pub uh, publications uh, submitted for legal deposit. Uh, Arlen. Okay. Um, let's see here. There we go. Uh, can everybody see and hear? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, Alistair. Too. I, I. I'm hot just now that I might use up all of our, our Q and A time because I, I was worried a little bit about length. So, I might try to speed through it. Um, no, I'm, I'm sure little, that's absolutely fine. Bit. My apologies again. Okay. Um, Anyway, so this is my um, my first time attending this conference, so it's been a, uh, wonderful to listen to all of you today. And I'd like to thank uh, Marie Claude Cote, who is um, LAC's representative on DCMI, for suggesting this opportunity for us to talk about our work. Uh, my name is Arlene, and I'm a librarian in the Acquisitions Division at, at Library and Archives Canada. And for the past few years, I've been working with a team to upgrade our digital systems and workflows, uh, specifically for legal digital legal deposit rather, and for academic theses and dissertations uh, from Canadian universities. So my presentation today, as you can see from this title, is about, is about this work. Uh, a bit about LAC, this is maybe one of the ones I can skip over a bit to save some time. Um, we were formed in 2004 uh, as a merger of the National Library and National Archives. 850 employees across the country, um, large and varied collections of all sorts of stuff. And we're currently uh, implementing new systems and workflows for the acquisition, management and preservation of our digital materials. Uh, so this presentation will uh, introduce uh, specifically two of the workflows that we've recently developed for um, some of our digital acquisitions. Uh, a monograph stream, which is primarily uh, for uh, material, digital materials submitted to us for legal deposit. Um, and we will soon launch um, a new online submission form for uh, for this. Where is my where are my notes here? Um, and uh, also our thesis and dissertation um, workflow. Uh, I know those are monographs too, but I mean, that's how we've been referring to the workflows here. So we'll just go with that. Um, just to note that our Onyx workflow, which we we will plan, which we do plan to develop for trade publishers, is uh, still uh, in progress. So the monographs workflow that I'm going to be talking about today is for smaller publishers, self-publishers, associations who need to submit publications to us for legal deposit, but who don't have Onyx data. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, our new form for digital monographs will launch soon. Um, and here's a peek at what they look like. Uh, publishers will create their own accounts <clears throat> and then fill in a form to upload their publications. Listed here are the fields that we asked for, um, and we're using the functionality of the form uh, as much as we can to enforce data entry standards when possible, for example, with drop down boxes <clears throat> or through checks in the workflow. When we can't enforce, we suggest, so we do have um, mouse over hover tips over each of the fields, giving examples of the type uh, of data that should go in the field. Um, and how to format it, for example, for creator names to <clears throat> input them in inverse order with last name, uh, last name first, and so on. 
there's a second way that publishers can submit if they don't have Onyx metadata with our bulk uh, bulk, uh, bulk submission method. <clears throat> They can choose to fill in an Excel spreadsheet to submit multiple titles at uh, the same time more efficiently. Uh, the fields are uh, almost the same as the previous form with the exception of removing table of contents and summary to make the uh, spreadsheet a bit more manageable. Again, we are trying to enforce uh, data entry standards from the publishers with some rules set up in the spreadsheet. For example, uh, they have to input the, the proper language code and they can find those language codes on a, a separate tab of the spreadsheet. We also have an instructions tab, an examples tab, so we're really uh, hopeful that publishers will input the information um, as correctly as possible. Once completed, they uh, upload it along uh, with the publication files using a form where they pick a few other um, options, such as the access level type of publication. So both of these forms for uh, our single title submission and bulk submissions are currently in a soft launch phase with some invited publishers. Um, the links aren't yet available to everyone on our site, but um, we plan to launch them soon. Once submitted, uh, the workflow checks for viruses, creates checksums, <clears throat> and prepares ingest packages for our Preservica repository, and the form data is mapped to mods. Our workflow enriches the data submitted by the publisher by parsing the title <clears throat> into initial articles, subtitle, and so on. Adding some things that you see here uh, on the list on the right, um, like language of cataloging or collection codes and so on. <laughs> and then I have some snippets of the um, of the mods uh, down at the bottom there, um, showing some of the things that we've added. <clears throat> at this point, our staff will uh, review and edit the submissions received. Our developer has uh, customized a mods editing template in Preservica for us so that we can easily uh, view and edit the data. We do several things manually at this point. Uh, and so the list there is on, on the right. <clears throat> it's uh, challenging to find the right balance always between keeping these forms simple enough for publishers so that they will fill them in and also gathering um, enough information to minimize um, the amount of editing that we'll need to do to create our catalog record. <clears throat> So back to the Theses Canada <coughs> workflow. Um, the second workflow I want to present has been in production for a couple of years uh, already now, and it's been going well. Most Canadian universities participate in our Theses Canada uh, program and allow us to harvest and host their theses and dissertations from their institutional repositories. We collaborate extensively with the universities before the harvesting process to ensure uh, good quality metadata and to troubleshoot harvesting issues. There are always a lot of things to troubleshoot. Uh, below at the bottom of the screen is a snippet of our um, master spreadsheet for harvesting with the specifications for each of the university repositories um, and some of the data that we, um, some of, of the other bits of university specific data that we that we add to the, uh, the data to, um, to make better records such as place of publication and uh, language of cataloging. Here's an example of one university's uh, ETDMS data. Um, ETDMS, I'm sure probably many of you know, is a, a standard that was developed by um, the N NDLTD to um, to uh, uh, sorry to uh, to allow for description of uh, theses and dissertations, and it's based on Dublin Core. Um, we have a lack specific set of mandatory fields that is, I've listed here and which we've selected as those necessary for us to uh, to create an acceptable mark record at the end of this workflow. Um, since we not only harvest the metadata, we also need to download the, uh, the full text files and we require uh, a URL directly to the files uh, in the ETDMS record with a file name extension. So just highlighted here in the, in the record are examples of those uh, URLs. Mm -hmm. As with the monographs workflow, we transform uh, the data that we received from the source into a mods record. We have selected mods as the, uh, the format used for all of the digital resources in our repository for both our archival and library materials. We enrich the, the data automatically with several additions listed here. 
And a snippet of metadata on the left just highlights a few of those um, enrichments that, that we're making or additions that we're making to, to the record, to the data as we uh, convert to mods. Um, given that the data is coming, uh, in this case, from university repositories where it's already undergone some quality control, we don't manually verify or edit each, each record um, <clears throat> coming through this workflow. And we accept that uh, there will be some errors and largely we have found that our, our records are pretty good and the universities are happy with them. So for both workflows, um, the, the workflow to upload the MARC records uh, to our library catalog uh, is the same. We have a weekly automated harvest that identifies all of the newly added records in our repository and sends them along uh, on a workflow to convert them to mark to mods records and then um, sorry that converts the mods records uh, to mark xml and then calls mark edit to to convert to mark 21. We had a couple more fields at this point here the the mark 856 and the 506 field which are automatically generated. Um, we do do some quality assurance uh, in, a, in the file in Mark Edit for uploading it to OCLC WorldCat for data sync. Uh, and then OCLC's data sync process uh, merges and matches and creates new records uh, in WorldCat and in our library catalog. Finally, a return sync process at the end of everything, um, at the end of the week, we'll update the MODS records back again in our repository with the OCLC number and any um, updated uh, data. This is an example of a MARC record generated uh, by this workflow uh, for a digital publication that was submitted for legal deposit using our new form. It's not great, but it's also uh, not very bad. We've decided that it is acceptable. Um, there is no formal subject analysis or classification. Um, however, the publisher has included a summary of table and table of contents for some good keyword access. At this initial stage, there, uh, there may be no authorized access points. Uh, since we are not doing any authority control um, for these particular digital records, although OCLC's automated controlling processes may add some later. There are challenges uh, for sure. The issue of matching or cataloging and publication or pre-publication records is a concern. We're not sure that that's always happening when we would want it to. Multi-part monographs uh, are something that we can't handle well with this, with this workflow without doing some further ed editing in our cataloging module. We use OCLC WorldShare. Still, we're pleased with the workflow and it's been going well in our soft launch so far. Public access to uh, the digital materials acquired through these workflows is through our catalog. Um, so the MARC records, as I mentioned, are loaded to, uh, to OCLC WorldCat. And the URL um, generates an index page that, that pulls some brief information from our MODS record to create um, a little citation here we can see on the right we've got uh, the title and the author the university name and then lists the files um, in our repository so that people can access the full text this is just an overview of uh, the journeys that each i think of the metadata is undergoing these journeys so this is uh where, where what's happening to it and where it's living the yellow boxes are uh, the data that we get from from the source from our publisher the MODS records that um, are in our inst uh, sorry in our digital repository in Preservica, and then transforming them uh, through Mark XML to Mark Twenty One uh, for our catalog. We continue to build workflows for other types of digital publications subject to legal deposit. So uh, right now we're working intensively on a, a government publications harvesting the weekly list of PDFs in Mark XML from Publications Canada, um, the D our, our depository services organization. Um, we're planning next to work uh, on an Onyx metadata uh, crosswalk, customizing the crosswalk for Onyx metadata from trade publishers. And of course, uh, serials and music are, are big challenges for us to tackle next. There's much to do, but um, we are enjoying the challenge and hopefully building some more efficient uh, workflows for our digital materials. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alan. Um, I wonder, um, with the, really the early engagement with the publishers, if um, you know, that might lead to uh, better quality metadata early on 
um, in the cataloging process, but also uh, might it lead to better actual engagement with deposits from publishers as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we found that um, that we did lots of early testing with, with these forms and we got a lot of good feedback um, and suggestions from publishers who were happy, happy to help us. And um, yeah, definitely it, it's a bonus for engagement on all fronts. And is it sort of helpful with smaller publishers as well, if they're able to engage with this? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so um, we do also have a question for Arlen from Yuha as well. Um, my question is, um, in this greater scheme of things, it's a detail, but it's a detail that we have been discussing a lot because we want to create a, a, a process that guarantees the digital preservation of the resources so that the critical metadata is available from the very beginning. So we think that we have to have uh, the <clears throat> checksum and the checksum algorithm and maybe also the date when the checksum was created as a part of the metadata, plus something that describes the file format and the version of the file format, which is even more complicated when you go down to the level that the digital preservation requires. I mean, I could see that uh, the, the, <clears throat> the National Library of Canada is storing uh, checksums, but it seemed to be some kind of local field instead of the one that Mark Format uh, allows for that purpose. Yeah, so we aren't storing the checksums in our, in our mark. Um, the 596 field is the, our Preservica reference ID, so the, the, the unique ID. Uh, for for the record in our um, in our digital repository, and uh, all of that preservation type information, the checksums, the the algorithm, the um, the file characterization, that is all in our in our Preservica repository rather than than uh, in the Mark record. Well, it's a good thing that you have this uh, process under control from the very beginning, so you can put the data in appropriate places. Uh, the, our problem is that uh, when the universities are creating the data at the moment, the <clears throat> all metadata that they can send us is either Dublin Core or Mark, uh, which is not really very suitable for this kind of metadata. But <clears throat> your process seems to be very advanced and I shall ask uh, my colleagues from the legal deposit department to take a look at them. Uh, I have a, a question for for you, Yuha, about the um, the elements in the scholarly resources application profile. I was wondering if you had considered including um, degree name and degree discipline. Um. <clears throat> the way this this process is still um, in uh, relatively early stages. So <clears throat> anyone can send comments to us and, and for instance, suggest additional metadata terms that we should discuss as a part of the process. And those uh, elements that you mentioned, I think, um, could very well be part of the finished application profile. We just uh, would like to <clears throat> avoid a proliferation of elements, avoid uh, the thing getting too complex to use and implement. So we won't accept uh, anything, <laughs> everything, but uh, I think those two elements sounded eminently reasonable. Thank you. We, we do have uh, challenges. For instance, metadata source is meta, metadata. And that has been a, 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 there has been ongoing discussion in DCMI about that for at least 25 years. 
and then affiliation is a problem in syntactic level because we need a way of connecting uh, creators and their affiliations to one another. And I have been informed by colleagues who are <clears throat> better informed that I, uh, than I am that, for instance, in XML, this is going to be a problem. Unfortunately, DC doesn't have subfields, and we are not going to uh, introduce that. As a DCMI working group, also participation is open. So um, if uh, somebody from your team uh, wants to participate in the working group, that would be another possibility. It's more direct way to influence uh, the <clears throat> development. Um, I do actually have a question for Yun Yung. Um, it's um, really with the um, export of records um, to uh, OCLC. Is there any sort of post export processing uh, where the records will have uh, both uh, Korean script and also any a possibility of transliterated script as well. I don't know if Yun Young, uh, if you're still there. Yes, I heard it. Sorry. Oh. Uh, can you ask me uh, again, please? Uh, yes, it was um, when you uh, export your um, your records to OCLC. Um, yeah. Is there any uh, processing um, uh, that goes on afterwards? where the records may become available with both uh, Korean script and also um, any transliterated scripts as well. Yes, we also uh, insert the Korea, uh, the Romanized script into mm. uh, our uh, uh, bibliographic record. Yes, in, in manual. Ah, the, the, I mean, the, this is of interest uh, to me because we do have an ongoing um, postgraduate uh, course in Korean studies at, uh, at Edinburgh. So it's um, you know, uh, good to know what we can expect to find when we uh, purchase resources. That's yes, but, uh, but, but unfortunately, uh, um, the rules uh, are different between our rules and uh, the uh, United States rules. So uh, different mm. rules, yeah. So, but we we insert the uh, transcription uh, of uh, title and author and publishing information uh, for uh, bibli bibliographic information. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, Tom, did you have a question for Lynette about how to access uh, the application profiles as well? The application profiles are actually maintained by NLB itself in, internally, so it's not available publicly through any links. Yeah. Okay. And, um, okay. Uh, well, uh, I would now just uh, throw the floor open if anyone has any final questions for any of our presenters today. Uh, well, in, in that case, um, I think I'll now hand over to Sam uh, for some closing remarks for the conference. Sam. I think it's uh, uh, very getting late. And thank you very much for uh, this session. And, um, and uh, really, I think Tom and I, we believe you all enjoyed this MI virtual conference as I guess we did. And, and this is the first time that we had the um, members forum uh, to express our deep gratitude. 
to your support and that plays a significant role of maintaining this MI work and service. And really, it was a delight to hear many wonderful works and plans of our members as very informative. We want to continue this session next year and welcome your suggestion for improvement. And really thank you so much for your financial and other generous support. And, uh, and our sincere appreciation goes to in you know, a conference chair, Marsha Zeng, and she did just a tireless work and uh, you know, keep us on track. And uh, the, all the wonderful organizing committee, we worked well so together and particularly the best practice Kyung and she did just a, a lot of work, wonderful work. And the panel organizers, Jen, Shigeo, Joseph, Life, MC, and Nishad, invite talks by MC and Alastair, and tutorial Kai and Magnus, student forum Joseph and Ruha and Nishad, members from LSD again, and social media management by Nishad. And we really want to express once again, wonderful two keynote speakers, Eero and Dan, and all the presenters and all the moderators who helped to run the session very smoothly. And um, also very sincere thanks to goes to a, you know, Sonny Han who managed all the event bright matters and Nishad for a wonderful technical assistance. And the DCMI will continuously, as I told before, and provide webinars and tutorials throughout the year to help all of us to stay tuned of major progress in innovative metadata implementations and we welcome member suggestions of a webinar and tutorial topics, please. And also I think this um, members forum is really wonderful and really uh, suggest a different way and more the ways we can improve. And uh, really I you know, thought came to me was uh, we could have uh, really have uh, some challenging uh, matters, putting it up uh, in this forum. And so we have a real discussion and we can plan ahead and we can also invite some uh, particular expert in, uh, in related to the topics and we could have uh, uh, the engaging discussion sessions that came to me and uh, let's discuss those options. And we could have uh, some planning meetings of a members forum before the uh, conference. We are looking forward to working with you all and we'll do our utmost to organize another useful conference next year and hopefully face to face. And, uh, and we have an idea to, together with the B-Frame conference in Budapest, if that works it out. Once again, my sincere thanks to all who contribute to this conference in various capacities and hope to see you again in our next event, webinar or tutorial and have a great day or good night. And I will say, and bye for now. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> you, have been, you have been wonderful. I, I cannot describe how appreciated I am. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.